A hostile country is trying to build a nuclear bomb. Behind the plot is a mastermind focused on the destruction of Israel. General Mohammed Suleiman hated Israelis, hated the state of Israel. It will take three elite black ops units to deal with this menace. Special forces operating deep within enemy territory to confirm the threat. That was an extremely risky intel gathering mission. If there was a mistake made, that could have been war. An elite flying unit to take it out. They destroyed their target. They exited. They lost nothing. And finally, an assassination unit to deal with the man behind the threat. Three of them came as scuba divers to his beach house, shot him, and then disappeared. This is the top secret story of the Israeli strike against Syria. North Korea 2004. Deep inside this secretive communist state, a train travels through a remote northern town. Then, suddenly, In April of 2004, there was a massive train explosion in northern North Korea. The explosion is so enormous, it registers a magnitude 3.6, equivalent to a small earthquake. It killed several hundred people, destroyed a town of 10,000 people, left 2,000 people wounded. According to the North Korean government, the train was carrying liquefied petroleum. But before anyone can discover anything more, the regime forbids further reporting on the incident. A week later, they banned all use of cell phones in North Korea for five years. Just what is going on in the rogue nuclear state? Five thousand miles away, one nation is following the incident with great interest. Mayor Dagan is Israel's top spy, the chief of the Israeli intelligence agency Mossad. Mayor Dagan was a, a legendary figure in the Israeli security establishment. He had a reputation for being very brutal in what he was prepared to do in pursuit of Israel's national security interests. North Korea behaving secretly is nothing new. But what intrigues Dagan are intelligence reports that a Syrian aircraft has now landed in North Korea. Contact between North Korea and the Arab world is unusual and highly concerning to Israel. And that was when the Israelis started to take a closer interest in what was going on. The plane is supposed to be delivering aid, but instead, it seems it is being loaded with the bodies of victims of the crash. And the bodies are being transported in lead-lined coffins and are carried by men wearing chemical weapon suits. This is extremely strange. Then Dagan is informed that the bodies in the lead coffins are not North Koreans, but Syrian scientists. There were 12 Syrian scientists from something called the Syrian Scientific Research Center, their covert military research and acquisition center. It raises a terrifying possibility for Dagan. Could North Korea be helping Syria to build a nuclear weapon? Dagan has to find out more. 
it becomes a top priority for Mossad and will eventually lead to one of the most extraordinary black ops of all time. Two years later, a woman walks into a London hotel bar. Her arrival is noticed by a man who's been drinking alone. But this is no innocent meeting. The man is a high-ranking Syrian nuclear official traveling to London alone. He comes to London residing in a Porsche hotel. He has a meeting tomorrow morning in, uh, in London, but he has the night or the evening to spend. He goes to the bar of the hotel and extremely happy that in the bar he meets a woman with a wonderful character. But what the Syrian doesn't know is that he is under surveillance. Mossad had been alerted to the Syrian's visit when he checked into a hotel under a false name. The Israelis dispatched teams of people to monitor him. Unaware he is being watched, the Syrian continues to flirt with the woman. And she's also impressed by him. He orders another drink and another drink, and he's confident that he has a wonderful way of spending the night. But he is also unaware that the woman is not as she seems. He doesn't know that this woman is a part of the Mossad crew, and she was there to keep him busy while her team is breaking into his hotel room. The Mossad agents are members of the Neviat unit, experts in covert bugging. The team specialized in breaking into hotel rooms. It takes just seconds for the Neviat team to override the hotel room security. Once inside, they realize they have hit the jackpot. The Syrian official has left his laptop completely unguarded. Immediately, they go to work. The Mossad was able to break in, get its hands on the laptop computer, and copy its contents off the hard drive. The agents transfer the entire contents of the computer hard drive to Mossad HQ in Tel Aviv instantaneously. They took all the information from the computer, and then they put devices on the computer to monitor any future activity from that computer. As they leave the room, the female Mossad agent abandons the unsuspecting Syrian. Within 15 minutes, Dagan and his analysts are looking at the files in Tel Aviv. What they found on his computer was really rather extraordinary. On one folder, they found uh, JPEGs that looked very odd. Appearing on the screens in front of Dagan are hundreds of photos documenting the construction of a large industrial facility. It was clear that this is an unknown facility, a huge one. The building they saw was quite large, 130 feet by 130 feet by 70 feet tall. Initially, the building resembles a treehouse on stilts with pipes leading to a pumping station. Later photos show modifications, and eventually the entire complex is hidden beneath a huge roof. Initially, Dagan is unsure of what the facility might be. But then, it begins to dawn on him what the images are showing. He sees large industrial equipment inside the facility. It is an exact replica of something Dagan has seen before in intelligence images from North Korea. They showed that it was almost an exact replica of the Yongbyong nuclear weapons facility in North Korea. 
it was exactly the same reactor. The two were perfectly matched. Dagon has no doubt as to what they have uncovered. The evidence was overwhelming. North Korea was building a nuclear reactor in Syria. The potential for a nuclear weapons program in Syria is a direct threat to Israel's national security and one that would have to be neutralized immediately. <laughs> 2006. Analysts for the Israeli intelligence agency Mossad have uncovered information indicating that Syria, with the help of North Korea, is in the process of developing a nuclear weapons program. Further evidence from the confiscated laptop of a Syrian nuclear official confirms their greatest fear. There were blueprints of the nuclear power plant. There were pictures of the nuclear power plant. The Israelis even had photographs of Syrians and North Korean nuclear experts together. It is Israel's nightmare scenario. A hostile nuclear power on its own doorstep. Whoever is building this has only one purpose, to build, to assemble a nuclear bomb. Dagan is now certain there is a nuclear weapons program in Syria. But he has no idea where it is. Intent on finding out, he orders Israeli satellites to monitor potential sites. Eventually, they close in on a remote area of Syria called Al-Kabar, where some highly unusual communications have been monitored. They intercepted a very unusual spike of telephone communications from this location at Al-Kabar, which is in the middle of nowhere in the desert, to Pyongyang, North Korea. It was very far from the capital, Damascus. It was in a remote part of northeastern Syria, but not far from the Euphrates River and the border with Iraq. Israeli satellites now pinpoint a large building at Al-Kabar. When they compare them with the stolen images from the Syrian laptop, it is a perfect match. Al-Kabar has to be the site of Syria's nuclear weapons program. Armed with the intel on the Syrian facility, Dagan goes to see the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. Mayor Dagan came to see Prime Minister Olmert and told him this uh, dramatic news that Syria is in an advanced stage of developing nuclear weapons. The Israeli Prime Minister immediately recognizes the seriousness of the threat. Olmert said one thing uh, right at the start, and that was the Syrian nuclear weapons program is simply intolerable for Israel. It cannot be permitted. This is an existential threat to Israel. This reactor has to go away. The only way to be rid of the nuclear weapons program is to blow up the reactor. But first, he has a series of questions for Dagan. Most importantly, how far advanced is the reactor? If it is already operational, then a bombing could cause a catastrophe. If the reactor is already active, then a full destruction of the reactor might cause an enormous environmental pollution poisoning. But Dagan doesn't know yet if the reactor is fully operational. The JPEGs were 15 months old, so this facility must be more advanced. They desperately need to find out how advanced the construction is. That means doing something extremely risky. Sending someone in to take a look. The next step would have to be risking the lives of operatives. Olmert has only one group of men capable of operating undetected hundreds of miles within enemy territory. So he calls upon Israel's elite black ops unit. In English, they are known as the unit. 
In Hebrew, they are the Sayarat Matkal. Sayarat Matkal is the highest elite commando unit of the Israeli army. Sayarat Matkal in Israel is nothing short of legendary or mythical. It's essentially the top unit in the army. Their job is to go on special operations that are considered uh, beyond the scope of your regular troops. It's a unit modeled after the British SAS. SEAL teams are similar to it, Delta Force is similar to it. They're some of the most highly trained units in the world. The Sayarat Matkal has one particular specialty, operating covertly behind enemy lines. The expertise of Sayarat Matkal is to infiltrate enemy countries in silent intelligence gathering operations. They've gone into Jordan, they've gone into Lebanon, they've done missions in and out of these countries undetected. While never officially confirmed, it is believed that on an overcast summer night, the selected commandos prepare to set out on their mission. They head deep behind enemy lines to confirm the existence of the Syrian nuclear weapons program. The Israelis have been very secretive about how they got there, but certainly they are very adept at using low-flying, almost silent helicopters. It is understood they boarded two Sikorsky CH-53 Sea Stallion helicopters to travel at low altitude and cross the border into Syria. The commandos are dropped a safe distance from the facility. Israelis were able to get on the ground within about a mile of this mystery building in northeastern Syria. As the commandos set off, they know that no matter what, the Syrians must not be alerted to their presence. Once the helicopters are gone, if the Syrians discover them, there is no chance of being rescued. But that was an extremely risky intel gathering mission. If there was a mistake made and they were compromised, that could have been war. The Sayarat Matkal commandos come within feet of the Al Kabar facility and immediately start intelligence gathering. The unit did the intel collection on the ground, right at the site. That was extremely dangerous. Collecting soil and water samples from around the facility is the most important element of the mission. It is the only way Israel can find out for sure if the reactor is operational. If the reactor is active, then a very small portion, not lethal, but very, very small portion of radioactive substance would be found in the water. Once the intel collection is complete, the commandos hide their tracks and prepare to depart. But then... They were almost caught. They left the scene in the very last minute. The commandos remain undetected. And with the mission complete, they return to Israel with the soil and water samples. The results of those samples will soon set into motion a series of even more dangerous covert missions into Syria.
Israel's elite black ops unit, the Sayarat Matkal, have successfully retrieved soil and water samples from behind enemy lines in Syria. In a government laboratory in Tel Aviv, the samples are now tested for nuclear contamination. The results of the exhaustive tests are delivered to Olmert and Dagan. The soil and water samples do contain traces of nuclear contamination but crucially, not at levels that indicate the reactor is fully operational. The samples prove that the reactor is still inactive. This is critical news. It means Olmert can now give the order to take it out. Omer calls a meeting of Israel's top military and intelligence chiefs. They are all in agreement on one thing. However this reactor got started and whenever it got started, the end is clear. The reactor is intolerable. We're not going to allow it and it, it's going to go away. Omer's only option is to strike from the air. Air power has an advantage. It can come like a light, it's very speedy. It can do the job with a lot of ordnance and disengage before the enemy understand what happened. The Prime Minister gives the order to prepare for an aerial assault on the Syrian reactor. It will be known as Operation Orchard. And for it to succeed, Olmert alerts another of Israel's special forces units. Squadron 69, known as the Hapatashim, the Hammer Squadron. There is no squadron better suited for a mission to destroy an enemy nuclear program. That's because they have done it before. Twenty-five years earlier, eight Hammer Squadron pilots flew into Iraq to bomb a nuclear facility being built by Saddam Hussein. I was a fighter pilot, a major, a deputy squadron commander, who prepared himself to destroy the nuclear reactor. Evading Iraq air defenses, they take out the facility in a clinical strike. The whole operation from takeoff to the attack was one hour, 43 uh, minutes and 30 seconds. But a quarter century later, an attack on Syria is a much harder prospect. For decades, Syria has been developing one of the most formidable anti-aircraft defense systems in the world. They've installed the Russian-built Tor M1 air defense system and have multiple surface-to-air missiles ready to launch against any air attack. Nothing is easy when it comes to attacking a country that has anti-aircraft systems, and so the Israelis worked hard on their countermeasures. The Hammer Squadron has aircraft specifically designed to evade such air defenses. The US-made F-15 and F-16 fighter bombers. The F-16 is well equipped to cope with a lock-on of a, of a missile battery. Uh, we can break the lock. Uh, we can use some ECM flares against guided missiles and some electronic warfare against the same batteries. They also carry electronic countermeasures that can fool the Syrian air defense system and allow the attacking craft to enter Syrian airspace undetected. A date has yet to be decided for Operation Orchard. But then Prime Minister Olmert receives intelligence that forces his hand. Mossad has detected activity on the Syrian coast. 
North Korean ships were arriving at the port of Tardis in Syria. These ships are carrying the final materials the Syrians need for the al Qaeda reactor to become fully operational. Omert has to act now. At exactly 11.59 at night, 10 Hammer Squadron pilots are ordered to take off. Even now, they have no idea what their target is. There were two sets of planes that took off around midnight uh, in early September. The F-16s and F-15s take off 20 seconds apart armed with 500-pound AGM-65 bombs. They head out to sea at nearly 600 miles an hour and follow a route designed to avoid detection by Syrian air defenses. What the Israeli Air Force did was map a route that would take planes to the west over the Mediterranean, then north, then east over Turkish airspace, Israel's prime minister and senior military commanders gather in the Israeli Air Force's underground command center known as the Pit. Here they monitor the route of the fighter bombers. Once it is established that there are no technical faults with any of the planes, three of the F-15s are ordered to return home. The remaining seven continue on the planned route at low altitude. They flew up the Mediterranean and then on the east on the Syrian-Turkish border. It is only now that the pilots are told that this is a live mission and that they are flying into heavily defended Syrian airspace. These elite pilots are trained to suppress nerves. As a fighter pilot, develop some mechanism and techniques how to depress the fear. I'm not telling you that there is no fear. If somebody will tell you he is not afraid, he is lying to you. It is always there. It is always with you. The fact that you can be killed. The Hammer Squadron is now just minutes from entering Syrian airspace and straight into the crosshairs of Syria's formidable air defenses. September 6, 2007, Operation Orchard is in effect, and Israel's Special Forces Unit, the Hammer Squadron, prepares for an aerial assault on their target, a Syrian nuclear reactor. As the planes approach Syrian airspace, it is now that they will encounter their enemy's air defense systems. The military side of the operation involved uh, somehow evading the Syrian radar so as not to alert the Syrians to their presence. Using codes allegedly sold to them by Russia, the Israelis are able to make the Syrian air defenses suddenly display hundreds of enemy planes. Then, just as suddenly, the Syrian system detects no enemy planes at all. To the Syrians, it appears like a brief technical glitch. So the Israelis actually made the Syrian system think that everything was normal, as though the radar screens were absolutely fine, but the Israeli planes were invisible. The Syrians didn't even know they were under attack. Now in enemy airspace, they move on to the next stage. Precise coordinates of the al Kabar complex are sent to the Israeli pilots on board computers and the plane swings south to begin their bombing run. So this is the risky time. This is where your breathing become much more uh, in, a, in a high pulse. As the pilots focus on the target, they are at their most vulnerable. You have one minute that you are exposed to everybody and you are not defending yourself because you are concentrating 
on aiming on the target. This is the one minute that the most difficult of the flight. As they begin their bombing run, the pilots suddenly detect anti-aircraft rockets. Back in the pit in Tel Aviv, they have no idea what is going on. Has the target been hit? Have the pilots been shot down? Then comes a radio transmission. It is the single word, Arizona. Arizona. The code word that confirms the bombs have found their target. Not a single Israeli plane has been lost, and the reactor has been totally destroyed. There was nothing left, really, but a smoking ruin at the reactor. The most dangerous part of the mission is over. When you release the bombs, you are much uh, lighter now. You can maneuver much stronger, and you go back to, long, uh, to a low level and then you start to relax. The pilots exit Syrian airspace at high speed. The mission is a complete success. They destroyed their target. They exited. They lost nothing. Omert immediately telephones the White House to tell President Bush that something that never existed doesn't exist anymore. there is a tense wait for the Syrian response. Omert is confident that the Syrians won't risk reacting publicly. But he cannot be certain. Immediately after the raid, he had sent a message to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad saying that Israel would not openly take credit for the raid. They calculated that if they didn't make too much noise about it, didn't claim responsibility for it, didn't boast about it, that it might be in Assad's best interest simply to ignore it. Sure enough, the gamble pays off. Syrian state news announces that Israeli planes had been repelled from Syrian airspace. It is a lie, but both countries are content to pretend that the bombing never happened. It seems Olmert has successfully safeguarded Israel's future. But one thing still bothers Olmert and Dagan. How had Syria managed to develop a nuclear weapons program in complete secrecy? For seven years, Israel didn't know about the number one project that the Syrians were engaged with. Now, a nuclear reactor is not something that it's easy to hide. It's a huge facility. So Mossad begins investigating how Syria has managed to keep the Al-Kabar facility a secret. What they uncover is that the Syrians had developed a networking system that avoided all electronic communications. They took a flight back in time. They said, let's, in the most sensitive issues, let's not use any sort of electronic transmission. Every time we want to send a message, we will print a hard copy, put it in an envelope, seal it with wax, write top secret, and build a network of couriers that would take these envelopes from place to place. And at the heart of this communication system is a man renowned for his hatred of Israel and one of the most powerful men in Syria, General Mohammed Suleiman. Mohammed Suleiman was the most powerful, closest advisor to the current leader of Syria, uh, Assad. His office was just across the hall from the office of the president in the presidential palace in Damascus. Because of his closeness to the president, 
Suleiman is known as Assad Shadow. This is the mastermind behind Syria's top secret nuclear program. Suleiman, he had credit for the compartmentalization within the Syrian government that allowed him to, to undertake this project for years. And no one knows about it. But Mossad has uncovered some even more worrying intelligence. The intelligence was that Suleiman had not gotten the message. After the destruction of the nuclear power plant, the Israelis received intelligence that the Syrians were resuming their efforts to build another nuclear power plant. The Syrians may have to start from scratch, but with Suleiman in charge, it seems that the Syrian nuclear weapons program could soon be up and running again. You know, technically, when you destroy a nuclear program, within five years, uh, the countries that have done it can do it again. If you have enough money, enough determination and know-how, and you start from zero your nuclear program, in five years you can have the bomb. The Israelis conclude that so long as Suleiman is in charge, they remain under threat. He and his talented bureaucratic and organizational capabilities are still around. So what do you do? For Israel, there seems no other option. They have to kill him. Israeli special forces have successfully neutralized the threat of a Syrian nuclear weapons program. But to ensure it does not return, they must now take out its mastermind, Syrian General Mohammed Suleiman. But eliminating Suleiman will be a much harder task than striking at a static building in the desert. The Syrian general is an incredibly cautious man. His movements are a closely guarded secret, known only to a few. In Damascus, he is under armed guard. Getting to him there will be impossible. But in the summer of 2008, Mossad discovers that Suleiman is planning to spend a weekend at his second home, a villa in the Syrian coastal city of Tartus. Security in Tartus is far more relaxed. If they're going to kill the general, this is the time and place to do it. But it will require another of Israel's black ops units to carry it out. This group is called the Kidon. Kidon means bayonet. Uh, they were known within the Mossad for assassinations, uh, but also knew how to slip in and out of countries. Among even their enemies, they are respected as extremely uh, talented and well-trained uh, in the operations theater. The Kidon is the most secretive of all of Israel's elite units and almost no operational details of their missions have ever been released by any Israeli government. They are notorious for one specialized activity, assassinating Israel's enemies wherever they may be. As the kid on study Suleiman's villa, they realize that although well guarded from the street, from the sea, the rear of the villa is totally exposed. The Israelis then discover that when staying at his villa, Suleiman hosts his guests on the balcony overlooking the sea. Initially, they consider bringing a boat close enough to the shore for a sniper to target Suleiman from the boat. But it seems this plan is rejected. They will only have one chance, and a long-range shot from a moving boat is just too risky. The further out the shot, the harder it is to get a headshot. When you're taking a shot from a boat of a guy on land, it's a little bit of a harder mission. 
The only other option is to send someone onto shore. A yacht sails up the Mediterranean coast towards Tartus. It is registered to a wealthy businessman, but today the crew is believed to be carrying two kid on snipers. They sent in a, a one of their intelligence assassination teams in a ship off the coast of Tartus, off the coast of Syria. About a mile off the coast, the yacht drops its sails, and the assassins make their way to shore. Snipers from the ship came as scuba divers to his beach house. At the same time, General Suleiman arrives at his weekend home. As the sun sets, the snipers supposedly emerge from the water. They watch the guests as they mingle on the terrace. Eventually, Suleiman appears. He was having dinner at his country home uh, along the sea. His friends and family were sitting around the dinner table. As the general entertains his guests, the two snipers line him up in their crosshairs. They get ready to take the shot. But then, their target is obscured. They move to a new position. The two snipers relocate and aim their rifles. They have earpieces enabling them to hear an electronic countdown. This will ensure they fire simultaneously. It was a difficult shot, but they did shoot until he was down, and the mission was over, and they got away with it. Both bullets had found their target. One in the head, one in the neck. Like the bombing of the reactor, Israel will never officially admit to the assassination of General Suleiman. The Israelis do not talk publicly about killing people overseas because it's actually against the rules. But they do say things, including in this incident, they refer to it as a very happy accident. Uh, that was actually an official statement. Taking out the threat of a Syrian nuclear weapons program has been an extraordinary accomplishment, calling upon three elite special forces units. The Sayorat Met call to identify the threat. The Hammer Squadron to take it out. And the Kidon to ensure that it cannot return. Thanks to these operations, a dangerous and volatile regime has been stopped from acquiring the most dangerous of all weapons of mass destruction. The importance of that has only been made more evident since 2011 when Syria began its descent into a vicious civil war.